Thank you so much to all of you for coming and joining the wonderful Ilan Pate and I in this book launch today. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to have the chance to finally speak about my work to an audience in Palestine and to do so in the company of Ilan, whose work has always been an inspiration and who is a central figure in the pages of my book as a prominent single state intellectual and activist. I'd like to begin our conversation today by saying that the theoretical directions of my work and of this book have been greatly influenced by the writings of the late Edward Said on both the work of Antonio Gramsci and his writings on counter-hegemony and on the centrality of the role of intellectuals and of knowledge production in the creation of social change. If I had to choose one central Saidian principle, though, that has kept coming back to me again and again as a piece of grounding wisdom in the process of writing this book, it is that everything we research, everything we write, the very analysis we are able to see or piece together on a particular topic is shaped by where we, as intellectuals and academics, choose to place our point of beginning. This, of course, ap applies to where we choose to begin a story or an analysis historically and contextually, but in the context of this book and of our conversation today, it more crucially applies to whose knowledge, whose geography, whose practices and struggles we choose to begin with when trying to engage in disciplinary conversations in academia. In the writing of this book, the answer to this question came to me through the work of Antonio Gramsci, who continuously underlined to intellectuals that in creating theory that aims at being a foundation for transforming the world, we must choose life. We must begin with the messy lived realities of people, of situated struggles, of physical territories, with the world's chaotic humanity and with the physical spaces this humanity inhabits. In doing so, we must also be open about the fact that knowledge is political, that its silences and erasures are often a reflection of the historical power dynamics in any society, and that countering these silences beyond just a reinsertion of an erased narrative or voice involves reinserting a different kind of theorizing. The reason I emphasize this need to begin with life when creating critical theory is because while it may seem like a straightforward thing to say, the problem with the theories created and debated in disciplines like international relations today is precisely the fact that many academics begin from within the discipline's abstract concepts and debates and apply them to life as timeless, unsituated, grand truths. This they often do as a result of the desire or the pressure to remain part of academic conversations. In doing so, though, these scholars unintentionally erase the complexities of life and the majority of the world's vast humanity from within the spaces, concepts, theories, and the very politics that they write about. So what happens when academics do the opposite and place their point of beginning for understanding the world or social transformation inside life? Or begin with the practices and self-understandings of activists and intellectuals struggling to create change on the ground? In my opinion, what happens is that scholars are able to create space for the asking of very different questions in academia, questions that aim at enabling a more humanly empowering and transformative politics in real life. In telling the story of the vision, strategies, and activism of this influential group of Palestinian and Jewish-Israeli single-state intellectuals, this book tries to join those in academia who are striving to create and decolonize this space. Similarly, in writing this book, I was also driven by the political desire to highlight an energizing window of hope in the making in an increasingly disheartening situation of escalating violence and despair. For, as Edward Said once argued, it was hope that was key in overcoming the daunting challenges the Palestinians faced as a people, hope that kept them alive as a collective, hope that empowered them to always reinvent and reimagine new possible alternatives at the darkest of historical moments. In this spirit, then, this book was inspired by the words of the late Howard Zinn, who said that, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. Always remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people behaved magnificently. It is to giving you a little snapshot of the intellectual vision of these inspiring intellectuals, who I first encountered at their inaugural One State Conference in London in 2007, and who have been attempting to create a political movement for a one state solution in Palestine, Israel ever since, that the rest of this talk will now turn.
In November 2007, the Annapolis Middle East Peace Conference, which took place at the United States Naval Academy, was applauded for creating history by being the first conference between Israel and the Palestinians within the framework of the American-sponsored peace process to directly endorse a two-state solution to the conflict aimed at demonstrating international support for the two-state solution at a time when U.S. State Secretary Condoleezza Rice warned that the window for the creation of a viable two-state solution was closing, the conference's joint declaration was strongly supported by the Middle East Quartet. Made up of the U.S., the EU, Russia, and the UN, the Quartet also took note of the broad international support for the Annapolis Conference and affirmed its commitment to seize this opportunity to mobilize international support to achieve meaningful progress towards a just negotiated settlement. In parallel to Annapolis, though, a different group of Israelis and Palestinians came together in a self-financed conference hosted by the School of African and Oriental Studies in London. Entitled Challenging the Boundaries, a Single State in Palestine-Israel, this conference was put together by students of the newly created London One State Group and the SOAS Palestine Society. Organized as a follow-up to the Madrid conference in July of that same year, it aimed at creating a platform for a broad debate on democratic alternatives to the two-state paradigm and making those ideas more accessible to the general public. Bringing together many of the prominent Israeli and Palestinian academics and activists who have written against the peace process since Oslo, the conference aimed at highlighting the fact that the two-state solution had failed to bring about peace and justice for the Palestinian and Israeli Jewish people. Instead, these intellectuals argued that the two-state solution served to distract from the territorial and political realities on the ground, to distract from the fact that the processes unleashed by Oslo entrenched and formalized a policy of unequal separation on a land that has become ever more integrated territorially and economically, and to distract from the fact that, even seven years ago now, an independent Palestinian state was no longer viable. Moreover, they argued that the process of the solution is based upon a false premise of equality in terms of both power and morality between a colonized and occupied people on the one hand and a colonizing state and military occupier on the other. They also argued that the process's historical point of beginning and terms are set within the unjust premise that peace can be achieved by granting limited national rights to Palestinians living in the areas occupied in 1967, while denying the rights of Palestinians inside the 1948 borders and in the diaspora. In view of this, these intellectuals argued that a just, liberating alternative must be found to counter this paradigm of peacemaking and its deflection from the continuing processes of separation and colonization in the land. After two days of debate, the conference ended with the drafting of the One State Declaration. This declaration set out the principles upon which all of the participants of both Madrid and London agreed an alternative democratic single-state solution should be founded and mobilized for. These principles included the fact that any proce process of justice must historically begin in 1948 and affirmed the fact that the land of Palestine historically belongs to all who live in it and to those who were expelled from it since 1948, regardless of religion, ethnicity, national origin, or current citizenship status, that any system of government must be based upon the principle of equality, that the Palestinian right of return must be implemented, that any form of state must be non-sectarian, that a process of justice and reconciliation must be launched, and significantly, that the segments of the Palestinian collective that have been historically silenced by Oslo, the Palestinian diaspora, the refugees, and the Palestinians inside Israel, must be the centrally involved in the creation of the contents of such a solution. It is these principles that remain the basis of unity within the vision, strategies, and initiatives of this group of intellectuals and activists, despite their divisions and lack of centralized coordination or leadership. In the conference's closing session, the London One State Group stated, The two days of discussion in London proved that there's a growing movement among Palestinians and Israelis that calls for thinking about their common future in terms of equality and integration rather than separation and exclusion. This movement was primarily defined as a decolonial counter-hegemonic struggle of resistance that is based upon the political desire to de-Zionize Israel-Palestine. 
This is rooted in the fact that it is political Zionism itself that is perceived by single-state intellectuals to stand in the way of justice, equal citizenship, and the liberation of both people's common humanity from oppression. As such, the struggle for a single-state solution in Israel-Palestine represents not only a struggle of Palestinian resistance and liberation, which of course it primarily is, but one of Israeli-Jewish liberation as well. For as Said highlighted in 1999, if this more inclusive worldview is to emerge as an effective force, it is imperative that injustice is jointly countered by both Israelis and Palestinians who seek an alternative pathway to real self-determination for all. As Ilan Pape would state some years later, the very composition of this movement must be a model for the future. Before proceeding further into some of the details of the vision of this movement, though, I'd like, to say, I'd like to say a brief word about the theoretical framings of my book so that it's a little clearer what kind of movement I argue that this single-state struggle of resistance is in the process of trying to become. The single-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict re-emerged largely as an academic debate centered on a critique of Oslo and driven by a number of prominent Palestinian and Israeli intellectuals. Re-emerging in the aftermath of the principle and processes of separation embraced and worsened by the Oslo Accords, this phenomenon of resistance seeks to highlight the failure of Arafat's strategy to create a viable two-state solution from within the paradigms of Oslo, and the expansion of the processes of Zionism on the land despite the existence of the American-sponsored peace process. In doing so, it strives to reformulate Palestinian resistance into a collective struggle that opposes Zionism and separation, is relocated within a framework of international law, universal human rights, and citizenship for all, and is based within the political desire to both reunite the Palestinian national collective and bring about a single state solution to the conflict built upon a vision of equal citizenship, democracy, and the sharing of the land among all of its inhabitants. Painted and dismissed by many as a utopian academic exercise, my work sought to take a different path, inquiring into the nature of the single state alternative as a movement of resistance. In doing this though, I discovered that the decentralization and many diverse personalities with uncoordinated actions involved in the broader picture of this single state project makes it difficult to decipher as a phenomenon that resembles any traditional view of what a movement looks like. Instead, I found that a more accurate reflection of the dynamics, shifts, and strategies of this movement emerged when viewing it through a Gramscian-inspired lens, one that centers on the revolutionary power of philosophy and the natural link between thought and action in building a new collective force against a particular status quo. In view of this, my book presents this alternative in terms of what Gramsci defined as a philosophical movement one that begins its struggle of resistance in the realm of ideas. As such, I argue that the single state alternative is a movement that is centered on the launching of a project of critical education by intellectuals within their own communities in order to change the common sense ideas linking them to an oppressive status quo in a process of mutual transformation and empowerment. This process itself is argued to revolutionize political possibilities on the ground and is reflected in Ilan Pape's assertion that while the current two-state solution needs politicians, the single-state solution needs educators and involves the launching of a long-term process of resistance aimed at decolonization, liberation, and empowerment. For Gramsci, this was the central meaning behind his claim that the creation of a new, liberating worldview was not only based on the triggering of a process of critical and historical self-understanding, but on the creation of a new form of civil and political society. The highlighting of the centrality of common sense ideas as an oppressive form of ideology within the framing of my work also seeks to emphasize that part of the struggle against these ideas involves an active effort by intellectuals to widen the scope of dissent and create spaces of resistance where none had existed before. So it's a strategy of resistance that involves the geographical and intellectual conquering of diverse, interlinked civil societies, turning enough of their institutions and associations into social forces that support a more just social and political reality. It is also an educative, 
gradual process and not one that starts from a place within which it has many followers. Thus, while it is often argued that the fact that the majority of Jewish Israelis, Israelis oppose a single democratic state solution today presents a significant obstacle to the present single state movement, for Gramsci specifically, this is not an insurmountable obstacle. For as many single state intellectuals point out, this struggle represents a process of resistance that must be built within civil societies. Thus, the central issue revolves around where to uncover the spaces from within which intellectuals can launch their counter-hegemonic movement and create new supporters and possibilities on the ground, and not how large or small their pool of supporters happens to be within the present moment. So what are the common sense ideas of the Oslo Accords that these intellectuals argue they are struggling to change among both their own people and the international community? The first of these revolves around the accepted idea that Oslo represents the launching of a process of peace. It's important to stress that for single state intellectuals, the peace process since Oslo does not reflect the launching of a comprehensive process for peace based on the desire for justice and reconciliation, but a process of separation and fragmentation. This is due to the Accord's choice of historical point of beginning. For beginning the peace process in 1967, as opposed to 1948, results in the erasure of the Palestinian Nakba and absolving Israel of any responsibility for the ethnic cleansing of 1948, and as such in closing a significant door for justice and reconciliation between the two people. Beginning the peace process in 1967 also denies Palestinian history and rights to self-determination by setting the occupied Palestinian territories as the only territorial part of historical Palestine on which negotiations can be held. Thus, the peace process involved negotiations that would lead to further territorial concessions and fragmentation within the West Bank and Gaza Strip from its start. By erasing 1948, it was also based on the fragmentation of the Palestinian collective from its beginning, excluding both the Palestinians inside Israel and the Palestinian refugees from the negotiating table. As such, the single state movement is an effort to relocate the search for peace and justice between Israelis and Palestinians in 1948, and crucially, represents a force that seeks to reunify the Palestinian collective, as Ali Abu Na'ma once argued, around an idea that serves the rights and aspirations of us all. In parallel to this, single state intellectuals argue that it is only by beginning in 1948 that true processes of justice and reconciliation can be launched between the two people. Thus, Aitan Bronstein of Zohrot argues, One state is the only arrangement that will permit Palestinian refugees to realize their right to return. The implementation of this right is both moral and a necessary step towards ending the conflict and reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians. It also gives the Israelis the opportunity to be true inhabitants of this land rather than settlers or colonizers. Only after Israeli Jews accept the right of return will they become aware of the real history and geography of the country rather than knowing only the mythology of the land of Israel. The second common sense idea struggled against by the single state movement revolves around the accepted notion that Oslo marks the beginning of a process towards a two-state solution. While Oslo was applauded by the international community as the beginning of a two-state solution to the conflict, single state intellectuals argue that it represented the launching and worsening of Zionist processes of separation and colonization on the land. These processes themselves, which have famously been argued by Edward Said to represent a modified Alon plan, are detailed in my book, but can also be summarized in Amnon Raz's words on the motivation behind Rabin's recognition of the PLO at the time, in which he stated, Rabin was a follower of Yigal Alon, who after the 1967 war outlined a plan according to which the district of Jerusalem, as well as parts of the Hebron district and the Jordan Valley, would be kept under Israeli sovereignty. The remaining territory would become an autonomous Palestinian area with a link to Jordan. Rabin considered the Oslo framework to be one which would enable him to achieve, via different tactics, the policy he had always favored. As such, it's important to note that single state intellectuals view the fact that the peace process is officially accepted as one that will lead to a two-state solution as both a misnaming of the two-state solution itself 
and as a def deflection from the realities within Israel-Palestine that have made a two-state solution territorially and economically unviable. These realities, of course, include the immovable obstacle of the expanding illegal Israeli settlement grid, which, as Yoav Peled has pointed out, was designed in terms of its density and territorial dispersion to make the occupation irreversible by fragmenting the territory of the potential Palestinian state and making the removal of the settlements impossible. In parallel to this, single-state intellectuals view the concessions made by Arafat in order to be able to return to the occupied Palestinian territories and launch a war of position from within it, as the beginning of the emergence of a Palestinian authority that was placed in an inevitable position of collaboration with Israeli occupation, while simultaneously having sidelined Palestinian popular resistance. Thus, the single state movement is an attempt at reigniting non-violent Palestinian mass resistance to the continuing processes of colonization, as well as a call for, reform, for both reformulating the PA and re-democratizing the PLO into an organization that represents and reunifies the whole Palestinian collective. Also, it is due to this position on the two-state solution that single-state intellectuals do not see their battle as one that is against two-state solution supporters, but one that is against the processes of Zionism and against those who support those processes. The third commonly accepted idea the single-state alternative takes issue with is the idea that the Palestinian Authority represents the Palestinian people. For, they argue, it was only Arafat and his small entourage in Tunis who were involved in the acceptance of the terms of the Oslo Accords on behalf of the PLO, which resulted in a crisis of representation within the Palestinian National Collective, as well as a questioning of the legitimacy of a leadership that viewed the internationally recognized rights of its people as bargaining chips that could be compromised. Thus, at the SOAS One State Conference, Joseph Massad famously stated, To date, no diaspora Palestinian has proposed to Israel that if Israel grant the diaspora a right of return, in exchange, it could deny West Bank and Gaza Palestinians their rights to self-determination and continue to colonize their land. Why, then, does the leadership of the West Bank believe that it can compromise the rights of Palestinians it does not even represent? In accepting the terms of Oslo and after, the PLO officially accepted the fragmentation of the Palestinian people and the erasure of the rights of the Palestinian diaspora, the refugees, and Palestinian Israelis. Hence, single-state intellectuals argue that the view that the PA represents the Palestinian people today is one that only holds if the only people recognized as Palestinians are Palestinians who are native to the West Bank and Gaza Strip and not the Palestinian refugees currently present within the West Bank and Gaza Strip. In this vein, then, only native West Bank and Gaza Strip Palestinians would be set to benefit from within the peace process. However, single-state intellectuals point out that even these Palestinians' lives have been made significantly worse by the processes of Oslo, with the only hope awaiting them being an apartheid, Bantustan solution. It's from within this context that single-state intellectuals seek to throw the PA into the dustbin of history and to redemocratize the PLO. More significantly, it is also from within this context that the single-state movement can be seen as one initially launched as a war of position of the Palestinian diaspora, the refugees, and Palestinian Israelis. As reflected in the One State Declaration, it is those who have been historically silenced by Oslo who must now become central agents in the mobilization and creation of a more just alternative to the status quo. Interestingly, in practice, while it was Palestinian Israelis who were originally acknowledged to have been the central energy behind the re-emergence of the single state idea after Oslo, it is the Palestinian diaspora who have been its fastest growing force. For those interested in more details on this and on the link between single state intellectuals and the emergence of the apartheid paradigm and the global boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, you'll find them in my book. And while I'm pretty much out of time now, I'd like to quickly point out that there are several other intellectual strategies of resistance that have emerged from within the single state movement's critique of Oslo, all of which I argue have been successful at changing people's conceptions, especially in the West, 
on what is possible and desirable as linked to solutions to this conflict. The most important of these include the move to emphasize the, the distinction between Judaism and political Zionism and to break the taboo on criticizing Zionism in the West, the move to re-Arabize Jewish history and counter the hegemonic European Ashkenazi depiction of Israeli identity and history, and the move to South Africanize the conflict in order to provide a more accurate lens into Israel's form of settler colonialism on the land, especially for American publics, and to advocate a rights-based approach to ending the conflict that is based in international law. In the words of George Bisharat, for example, one of the reasons that the anti-apartheid movement in the U.S. reached such heights was because it resonated with the American civil rights movement. Unfortunately, that's not the way Israel-Palestine reads to Americans. If you talk to Americans about settlers or settlements, some of them actually have a positive connotation of that because it reminds them of the American West and of pioneering settlers. Apartheid, however, they all know that apartheid is bad. They all respond to it. So yes, I think that analogy is a valuable tool. And it's not just a valuable tool. It's accurate. Described by Omar Barghouti as a three-tiered form of apartheid, this form of domination is argued to include the occupation and colonization of the 1967 territory, the system of racial discrimination against Palestinian citizens of Israel, which is the Zionist form of apartheid, and the total denial of refugee rights, particularly the right to return home and to reparations. In conclusion, though, I'd like to emphasize the fact that the single-state alternative emerged from within an explicit political desire to highlight the historical and territorial facts on the ground that have been silenced by an abstract peace process since the Oslo Accords. For single-state intellectuals, then, their political project of counter-hegemony represents the exact opposite of what many critics have accused them of, namely, that they are engaged in a dangerous exercise of promoting an, an impossible utopian alternative to a conflict that requires an urgent solution now more than ever before. In this spirit of trying to highlight what actually exists on the land as opposed to utopias, I'd like to end with a quote from the criti critically acclaimed Israeli documentary filmmaker and academic Eyal Sivan, in which he said, it might be a professional deformation, or just a refusal of notions like utopia, but I have a problem in speaking about a one-state solution as a future idea. I deal with documentary cinema, and documentary cinema deals with what exists. One state is the accurate juridical definition of what is today the ruling power over Palestine or Eretz Israel. This is not about a revolutionary position that requires us to think about how we can create this one state. What I'm talking about is more modest and more concrete, the transformation of the existing one state into a democratic state. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you all for being here tonight, freezing with us. Nothing to warm you up like a good utopia. <laughs> there are two ways, probably, of uh, thinking about the one state, the way it is portrayed in Shireen's book as a resistance movement. And I should just say in brackets that I had the... the, the I was very fortunate to be uh, the external examiner of uh, Shireen's... Uh, PhD, and already then I was impressed by her uh, uh, industrious approach to a topic that for me was just uh, beginning to ignite my imagination and uh, occupied my political as well as my academic life. And it was very interesting to see it for the first time in the form of a PhD, which by itself is an indication how far we have gone with this new conversation in town about the one state uh, solution. But there are two ways, and probably the best way is somewhere in between. And to demonstrate this uh, sort of uh, bipolar approach to uh, 
an idea such as the one state, especially when we talk here in Jerusalem, where the powers that be, be they Palestinians or Israelis, do not want to hear the term, are totally, uh, object, they totally reject the term, and in fact help to create a reality that they think is uh, uh, an antithesis to the idea of a one state uh, solution. In the, the bipolar kind of presentation, uh, it, it, probably the best way is to talk about two people uh, and their views about, uh, about the reality here. One I knew very well, the other I didn't and I don't uh, regret it. Uh, the first is uh, Maxime Guilan, the other one is Theodore Herzl. Maxime Guilan, uh, for those of you who know, was uh, an Israeli poet, an activist, um, and an anti-Zionist who uh, left uh, Israel in the early 70s uh, and came back like so many Israeli Jewish anti-Zionist dissidents. Um, so why don't we just uh, send uh, letters to our followers instead of uh, uh, exhausting all our financial, mainly mine, financial resources? And he said, Ilan, you don't understand politics, do you? It's very clear. Uh, there's going to be a disaster in this country, and everything's going to be in ruins, and only high-quality paper is going to survive. <laughs> and in that high-quality paper, we'll have these uh, fantastic ideas for the people what they should do in order to get out of the disaster. So that's one way of looking at the one-state uh, discourse, uh, something that we should all talk about and write about, uh, not because it's for immediate use for tomorrow, but because eventually everybody would realize there's nothing else to do in this place. Uh, the second, of course, is Theodor Herzl's idea, to write a utopian novel of a group of Germans that comes to Palestine 25 years after he writes the book, and see the creation of a Jewish state instead of Palestine, uh, a book that became a reality, not in every detail, not in every chapter, but definitely had the power to ignite the imagination of poor Jews in Eastern and Central Europe to be members of one of the cruelest and ruthless settler colonialist project of the 20th century. And in many ways, uh, if the one-state solution will not just be academic books, if it will be also uh, uh, done in uh, a more cultural way, uh, it definitely can serve in a similar way. But I think what Shirin's book tells us about the people who talk about one state, who think about one state, is that it's somewhere in between. Nobody, non, non, not one of them, uh, thinks about himself or herself as utopian, and not one of them uh, would like to wait to total disaster so that their ideas would be heard for the first time. Uh, it's, it's a matter of an understanding, a kind of self-understanding that you are not representing anyone. It's not a movement in the sense that it has chosen the political path of representative bodies, elections, uh, and uh, finding the right mechanism to have a constant consultation with the people whose future you want to improve, in fact, whose life you want to save. It's not about that. It's about uh, a shared realization of the reality as it is today, and in many ways a shared vision of what the reality should be. Uh, its only way of examining its ability to be to have an impact, its only way of uh, its ability to have an impact, is not asking the question in this conventional political way: Who do you represent? How many people support you? What is the position of the powers that be towards you? And all these, if these were the three questions that Shirin would have asked in her book she would have felt a bit like either Maxime Villano or Theodore Herzl. I don't know which one of you, which one of them you would prefer to be. But th these are not the question. The question is, in fact, a very strong conviction uh, represented in the quote of Eyal Sivan that you bring in the end of your talk tonight, 
that the one state, first of all, is already here. So, it's a matter of calling a spade a spade. It's a matter of people who, like in, in the first, uh, kind of familiar jokes, uh, are going against what everybody would say is against the direction in the highway, but they think everybody else is crazy because they are driving in the, in the wrong direction. It's the fact that you, you have a reservoir of words, of uh, descriptions, of uh, ideas and concepts that you think describe accurately what you see on the ground. And that the hegemonic conversation, whether it comes in the mainstream media, mainstream academia, or employed by the politician, has nothing to do with the reality on the ground. And I think when, when you look at the kind of common uh, basis of the people you were to, uh, writing about in your book, nothing comes clearer to mind than the sense that the so-called peace process that has informed and uh, sustained such an industry of humanity. I mean, so many people uh, have been involved in that peace process. So many people have made money out of this peace process that it has a life of its own. It, it cannot stop on also because it's a great employer of, of people. But its resonance to the reality on the ground every passing day becomes clear how far it is. It's as if they are talking about the place on Mars or on the Moon, but not on the reality on the ground. So I think the, the grounding factor of those who speak about the one-state solution is, first of all, a sense that we describe the reality much better than those who have the power to represent the reality, whether through politics, media, or academia. In this respect, it doesn't matter how many people feel that way, and it really doesn't matter whether they represent someone or are they powerful enough. It, it's a very strong motivation to continue what you do, and if you're not alone, and you can have conferences and so on, you, you have the power to continue. The second uh, uh, feature I would like to mention in this respect is that Shireen's work was uh, in many ways a pioneering work, but today, a lot of PhD students are working on the one-state solution. A lot of academics are working on it. And you can look at it from two ways. You can say, all oh, right, these academics have nothing to do with the reality if they work on a solution that is not being translated into reality on the ground. Or you could say that this is the most refreshing, the most invigorating, the most hopeful idea you can engage with if you are an academic who writes about Palestine and you don't belong to a Zionist uh, institution. Because that means that probably most academics in the world who write about Palestine, and there are hundreds of them, have not chosen, have not chosen Palestine just because it fitted a successful academic career or it was conducive to a certain personal problem. Most of the people who write as academics about Palestine write it with a modicum of commitment, if not more than a modicum of commitment. And I, there are very few who write about the two-state solution. The very few would like to analyze the Oslo process anymore. Most of the people who write, write about the one-state solution, write about the vision of de-Zionizing the whole of Palestine, writing about applying the paradigm of settler colonialism to Zionism. These are not all new ideas, of course. They were uh, uh, pronounced long time before in the 50s and the 60s by anti-Zionist activists uh, in Israel on the one side, and of course by the groups that eventually made up the PLO in the 50s and the 60s on the other side. But they have a new life. And this new life is a new conversation on Palestine that has its own dictionary, has its own new uh, 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 verbs and uh, uh, vocabulary to describe the reality. And uh, uh, it is now a main interest and preoccupation of academics, alternative media, social activists. Now, who is immune from talking about one state as a vision as a paradigm that describes the reality. Who doesn't want to talk about uh, an idea that replaces the peace process with the wish to 
see a regime change between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. Regime change, that is a, a legitimate word or action, if you use it uh, when you talk about the Arab world, but is equivalent to anti-Semitism and the destruction of the Jewish people if you apply it uh, to Israel. Who are the people who are immune from this? The political elites on both sides of the divide in this country, uh, each for their own reasons, uh, uh, have understood that brushing aside this new conversation as utopian, irre irrelevant, imaginative, and so on, is not working anymore because outside the context of their life, which is in Ramallah or Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, outside the context of their life, it does resonate with people. In fact, it resonates with millions of Palestinians. It resonates with millions of progressive Jews and any other person who's interested in the fate of Palestine. So they cannot brush it aside anymore as an irrelevant marginal idea. So they decide to defame it as a danger. Now, of course, if you turn uh, a discourse that is employed by dozens of intellectuals as a, the existential danger, you empower that discourse. And in fact, that's what happened when Netanyahu was elected last time and regarded the whole discourse of one state as more dangerous, he said, to the state of Israel than the Iranian bomb. He calls it delegitimization, but it's the same thing. It's the whole idea that anyone who believes in a democratic regime between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean uh, talks about the destruction of the state of Israel. He really helped to upgrade the conversation about the one state from the beginning of a Gramscian counter-hegemonic discourse into a decisive plan to destroy the state of Israel. I don't think it is, but he definitely empowered this whole uh, conversation. Uh, who else is against it? Uh, a colleague of mine with whom I just published a book uh, uh, coming up, came out in Penguin this week, uh, who is one of the best intellectual minds in, in our century. Uh, and uh, uh, he has another younger colleague, He's not so young, he's actually older than I am, uh, uh, who is even more vehemently opposed to the idea of a one-state solution, which shows you that there is still a, a rigorous intellectual rejection of the idea of, of the one-state solution by people who are deeply committed to the Palestinian uh, cause, who are deeply committed to principles of justice, uh, social justice, and justice in general, and yet feel that the one state, like the right of return, are two emotional utopians' vision that would mislead disempowered people to believe that their reality could be improved unnecessarily. Uh, the problem with this point of view is, of course, that anyone who does not belong to the Zionist Israeli society is disempowered in Palestine. And if anybody who is, doesn't belong to that powerful group would only succumb to the reality, to the balance of power, we can all go away or just give up the resistance. The moment you try to adopt a business-like approach to resistance, you try to use pragmatism and realpolitik as the main values by which you lead a struggle, you will always succumb to the power that be, and he will never properly challenge it. Maybe the other option is also very weak in its power to change the reality. But at least it empowers the people who employ it and the people who believe in it to struggle because that reality is something that they want. It's not something that they compromised about. And the Palestinians had three or four junctures in history where they were convinced by the inter international community to compromise. And whenever they compromise, the only message they're sending to the Israelis is that they need to compromise more. And I think this is part of the power and the strengths of the, the one-state uh, 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 conversation. Let me finish by saying the following. 
I feel a bit uncomfortable talking about a book in which I'm one of the, uh, uh, of the, if you want, protagonists. English is a wonderful word. I mean, if you don't work, language, if you, you have an embarrassing word, you immediately have something which is less embarrassing. Uh, so protagonist sounds sort of neutral. Uh, it's, it's even, even more embarrassing when, because I know all the protagonists. And I know them well. I mean, it's not like that uh, uh, I know them sort of slightly. I know them very well. So to call the people I know a movement uh, is a bit much, I must, I must admit. Uh, I've also participated in all the conferences that Shirin writes about, and I'm not sure I would call all of them conferences. And I remember the uh, negotiations for uh, authoring the documents that you are talking about, and typical to groups of the left, the hours you spent on a comma and uh, a full stop as if the future of the world, as if the future of the world uh, depends on it, uh, as if tomorrow you have to uh, compose the government of the one-state solution and it's just a matter of the right language and then reality is going to change. But nonetheless, with, with all these sort of depredations about uh, enhancing or sort of blowing out of proportion the conversation of the one state of which I was one, still am, one of the protagonists, I come back to the early point I made with this I will end. There is something very powerful when you suddenly see the reality for what it is. Now, of course, many people would claim we see the reality as it is. How, why do you claim that your view is better than ours? But it is the power of Palestinians and Israeli Jews and Jews around the world and Palestinians in exile seeing the reality for what it is together that make it, makes it so powerful. Because if you look, even at the best moment during the brief history of the Oslo Accord, even at the best moment, where maybe the champagne bottles were drawn out in Oslo uh, by the first group that still could hope that they have heard the wings of history and they were about to make history, the level of mistrust, the recognition that they were fighting a battle in diplomatic terms instead of the battlefield. All this mistrust, all this inhumanity, all this Palestinian recognition that they are succumbing to a powerful colonizer, all this is gone in the kind of dialogue we have on the one state solution. And that's, I don't want to, to idealize it, but I must say that uh, not even the early members of the Communist Party who found some sort of a joint agenda in the 1930s when the first Palestinian members joined the Communist Party in Palestine, not even they, I think, realized what equality means and what a joint human effort to deal with the reality is all about. And in that sense, it is a movement, in that sense, it is a resistance. And I would like to thank Shireen again for being bold enough and to take something that for me looked a bit marginal, a bit on the edge, a bit utopian and unrealistic and helped at least me to understand that this is a far more powerful force of history that uh, if it's not going to transpire tomorrow, I'm sure it will leave an impact in the day after tomorrow. Thank you.